the beginning of the semester, we talked about how statics differed from dynamics and solids, that we were going to study equilibrium of objects that neither deformed nor accelerated. And we went back and said, what kind of objects are we going to consider? We're going to consider particles, rigid bodies, and systems of rigid bodies. Now, we've done the particles, and we've done rigid bodies, but we're going to stick with them a little bit longer. We'll do systems after the next exam. We need to then ask what kind of loads act on those objects. We said forces act on particles and rigid bodies. Moments act only on rigid bodies. Now, I want to go back and talk about the forces that we had at the beginning. See, the problem is there is no such thing as a point force, which either means we're going to have to figure out how to make a real load look like a point force, or I've wasted six weeks of your life. So let's assume that that's not the happening, and we're going to actually need to take a real mechanical force and relate it to a point force. So what's a real mechanical force? So if you think about the weight of a block, we've modeled that all the way along as a single arrow acting down in the middle. But it's not like if I put that on the table, an ant could crawl right up to the arrow and then be okay, and then be okay again right on the other side of the arrow. If he's anywhere under there, I can squish him. So the weight, or the force that I apply here, actually acts over this whole area. Anything under there can get squished. So if that's what I've actually got, how do we deal with that mathematically? Well, there's a little bit of weight over here, and a little bit of weight over here. And if I wanted to, I could think about this block as four blocks. And I could take that block, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and each of them acting on the table. And then I'd have the weight from this one, and the weight from that one, and the weight from the next one. And since you've all taken calculus, you know what comes next. We're actually going to break this up into infinitely many little bits of weight. So if the whole block weighs 0.4 pounds, then each of the individual blocks would be 0.1 pounds. But really what I'm looking at is, what's the pounds per inch? What if I had two of these blocks? The pounds per inch would be the same. So what am I going to do? I'm going to define a load intensity diagram. That is literally the bunch of arrows that are joined up at the top. It has units of force per area or force per length, depending on whether we're doing 2D or 3D. This is the little bits of weight that act all the way along there in a quite continuous fashion. Now, how do I get an equivalent point load if I start with this? This is a distributed load or a mechanical load, That's the two things we call them. And they look like this. How do I get that into a point force? Principle number one, the area of the load intensity diagram is the magnitude of the equivalent point force. And I use this word equivalent very advisedly. It's the same thing as when we were dealing with equivalent systems. An equivalent system is any two systems are equivalent if the sum of the forces is the same and the sum of the moments taken at the same point is the same. So if this is going to be equivalent, then I need to have the sum of the forces being equal to point four, and it needs to act at the same spot so that the moments are the same. So what is this x? Where does that force go? Now intuitively you can tell me, if I'm dealing with a quite uniform rectangular block, where's the point force go? It goes in the middle. We've been doing that all the way along. But what does it look like when things aren't, aren't quite so uniform and symmetric? The equivalent point load acts at the centroid of the load intensity diagram. Not the centroid of the block, the centroid of the blue load intensity diagram. So if this is a rectangle, the centroid of a rectangle is in the middle. And the area, which is the magnitude of the equivalent point force, is based on height. So I will take two and a half and multiply it by 0.16 pounds per inch, and I get the area of my rectangle is 0.4. Now, if I took instead a nice triangular block, the force per length on this side is the same, but the force per length as I get over to this corner is going to go to zero. So my load intensity diagram looks like a triangle. How does that work? Well, the magnitude of the equivalent point force is the area under the load intensity diagram. It's a triangle, one half base times height. 
So 1 half base times height gives me 0.2, which is luckily half of what I had before. It's a nice unit block. It's easy. Don't forget the half. A lot of people forget the half. Get the problem wrong. Be a little bit careful here. Sometimes what we give you isn't actually that the height of that arrow. See how this, is, this number refers to the length of that distributed load arrow, just like this one does. Here, what I've done is I've specified for you not the height of this side, but the slope of that line. I can do that. I still define the triangle. So take the slope, and you can figure out that, in fact, this would be 0.16 over 2.5. That gives me this number. I can use the slope of a line. I can just say this is whatever this height is, mx plus b, to find out what the same numbers will be here. In fact, you can think of this as some sort of f of x curve, where this is my x-axis, and this is my y-axis, and this is a shape. And f of x is the line at the top that joins all my arrows. The area under the curve is going to be the integral of f of x dx. Now, there are a couple points I just want to remind you of as we're going along. Like anything else, we're doing an equivalent point force. So your free body diagram can include the distributed load or the equivalent point load, but not both. You can't include them both. Um, like any other force, if you want to take so much over here and so much over here, I can certainly break up a distributed load too. So if I have a rectangle and a triangle, I can find the equivalent point load for the rectangle and the equivalent point load for the triangle and put them where they would act. So the centroid of a rectangle is in the middle, and that would act here. The centroid of a triangle and I didn't actually say that, so let me put this back up again for a minute. The centroid for a triangle is a third of the way from, I say, a third of the way from the big end. So if you have a right triangle like this, a third of the way of 2.5 tells me where this acts. If you think about a triangle, there's going to be more weight on that side than this side. And we will prove this momentarily when we get to centroids. So a third of the way from the big end in this distributed load here would be one, one inch in. So that gives me where this triangle will act. Uh, last but not least, if you have a line of symmetry, you know that the centroid lies there. Um, to find anything else, you need to know how to find a centroid. And I know you did that in calculus, but most of you don't remember it. So <laughs> we will do it again in the next videos.